Okay, so uh, I'll go for about a half an hour, and then David is putting together some extravaganza of commentaries or something. Right? Um, so, given that one has an infant who, let's say, by 12 months of age, has um, established reasonably robust phonetic categories in their native language, um, the, the challenge for acquiring language is not merely to solve the speech perception problem, right? There are many other levels of language that one needs to tackle in a, a, an elementary level of language. Uh, beyond the level of speech perception is, is word recognition. And there's been quite a bit of work done on that in the last uh, 15 years or so. And so I'm going to, again, just whirlwind tour through that, focusing somewhat on idiosyncratic stuff from my lab, but also uh, concentrating a bit on methodology, because I think it's, it's useful for you to understand how you would go about doing this in, in babies. So, um, hmm. there we go. So there, uh, Pat Cool has a, a nice uh, review paper, God forbid, already 10 years old, um, that, you know, is, it, is, it, is a more or less reasonable, uh, you know, there's some nuance in the last 10 years that has changed things, but it's, it's a nice timeline of the kinds of um, onsets of functional capabilities in infants, both on the production side and on the perception side. So I, I highly recommend that as kind of a background reading if you haven't looked at it before. Uh, and we're focusing now here on this age range from 6 to 12 months of age when infants have, are beginning to uh, establish robust phonetic categories and applying them to uh, understanding what words are. And one of the um, uh, early um, attempts to understand word recognition in infants was to uh, use a procedure called preferential listening. And the basic idea uh, in preferential listening is you just present tokens and just ask how long the baby likes to listen to them. Very, very simple uh, measure of preference. In the uh, instance in which infants show a preference, then of course you can demonstrably say that they have a preference. In the case when there's a negative result where they don't show a preference, you can't really say much of anything. Maybe they can discriminate them but don't care. Maybe they have no preference. Um, and one of the early studies that was done here was just isolated words uh, out of Peter Jusick's lab was uh, <coughs> trying to get a handle on whether infants recognize isolated words that they might have been familiarized with earlier in their, in their, uh, in infancy. And so they focused on the, the child's name because they thought that that might be a very, very common uh, item in their environment. And sure enough, even by four and a half months of age, infants show a preference for listening longer to their name than to a foil name that has somewhat the same kind of prosodic structure or um, number of syllables and so on. So it, it's a, a rather crude measure, but interesting that as early as four and a half months of age, they have extracted something from their early linguistic environment about words. Peter and I then um, had, these studies were going on simultaneously. This one came out a little bit earlier. We're interested in, given that infants can discriminate between different speech sounds, <coughs> how do they recognize a word when it's embedded in fluent speech? So we created these sort of dumb little sentences in which there was a common word in each one of the sentences. Uh, and then we tested at the end on isolated versions of those words. So just the word bike or just the word feet compared to two other words that they had not been exposed to in that prior three or four minutes of exposure. And what we found is that they showed a reliable preference for listening to the isolated word that had been embedded in those fluent sentences just a few minutes earlier. And moreover, we tested with other words that sounded like the words that they had been exposed to in the prior <coughs> sentences. And they did not false alarm to those similar but not identical test items. So that tells you that when they hear the word bike repeatedly embedded in fluent speech, that they're not just accessing that as some sort of global representation where you would think that a word, a nonsense word like geik would be close enough and that they would take that as a, an example of the token that they had been exposed to prior to that. Um, now, this, these sentences here, of course, raise the question of how do you know where one word ends and the next word begins? Because if we looked at the auditory waveform, most auditory waveforms are more or less continuous energy, acoustic energy. 
how do you parse that into the, its underlying lexical units? And of course, there are some obvious places where you can do that parsing, like here, which is the um, end of the word word and the beginning of the word boundaries. Right? So there's lots of information there. There's closure of the vocal tract. Right? That's, what, that's what you're seeing here. And that's a useful cue to a word boundary. But there are other word boundaries here that have no obvious acoustic cue. And so the question is, how do infants gain access to the word segmentation problem before they have any notion that words are meaningful entities? So this is just purely at the acoustic level. How do you get that chunk of acoustic stuff isolated so that you can then map it onto something in the world? as a referent. Um, and there are a number of cues. So you could have isolated words, and there certainly are isolated words, um, like the baby's name in that previous experiment, or the word no. <laughs> um, there are also prosodic sources of information. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but there's also statistical information. It's, it's the likelihood that certain words will follow, uh, certain sounds will follow other sounds. In fact, that's the way words are generally constructed in linguistic systems. And a simple way to think about that is that if you had two utterances like this, what's the likelihood that ha is followed by p, right, that forms the word happy, versus p is followed by be, right, which spans a word boundary. It's the last syllable of this word and the first syllable of that word. If infants could figure that out merely on the basis of the statistical properties of the input, then they would have a leg up on this word segmentation problem. And so uh, this is probably not going to work. Oh, no, it is going to work. Awesome. So we created uh, a stream of speech with a speech synthesizer because we wanted to get rid of all of the other sources of information that naturally occurs in real language, things like prosodic variations, timing differences, pauses at the end of utterances, and so on, and just present them with statistical information. And so this is what they were exposed to for th two minutes. I hear this as words. You might not. It's in fact four three-syllable words and only four three-syllable words in random order with no repeats. Um, and that creates a set of transitional probabilities, the likelihood that one syllable will follow the next. So go la tu is one of these words. And so that means la always follows go and tu always follows la. And then you get another triple. And because you're getting another triple, that means that there is a less likely that two will lead to that particular next syllable, because it could lead to the first syllable of one of the other words. And because there's three other words that could follow any given word, that transitional probability is 0.33. So the infant then is going to be tested on an isolated word. So it's like getting exposed to that sentences with bike and feet in it, and then getting tested with bike or feet in isolation. Well, now they're getting exposed to this big, long sentence. It's just one sentence. And they're going to be now tested with go la tu, which is a word, versus tu da ro, which spans a word boundary. Right? It's the last syllable of one word and the first two syllables of the next word. And again, it's the preferential listening procedure. Um, and this is just a cartoon with data showing that when they're presented with a word, they show this amount of li listening time, and when they're presented with a part word, which is the less statistically coherent um, a triple from the stream, they're, they're showing this amount of listening. Now, you may have noticed in the previous slide, in the bike and feet thing, they showed a familiarity preference, and here they show a novelty preference. I have a whole nother lecture on that. <laughs> I don't want to get into it. The important point is that there is evidence of discrimination. The only way you could get evidence of discrimination, whether it's familiarity or novelty, is if they have extracted something from the prior listening experience. This is not something they could have brought to them into the experiment because they'd never been exposed to these stimuli before. Could you perhaps just give us a two-sentence version of why? Yep. So the two-sentence. Yep. Reading this literature more than anything yep. else, the you can interpret a result going in either direction as meaning the same thing. Yep. So uh, the the two-sentence version is that in the prior experiment, the Jusik and Aslan experiment, each individual word had been presented to each infant 12 times. In this case, each individual triple had been exposed to each infant 45 times. So there's a, a view in the literature that if you have light exposure, that you're more likely to show familiarity preferences. And when you beat them over the head 
and really, really, really bore them, you tend to get novelty preferences. We have done the key experiment, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> okay, so this tells us that they can solve the word segmentation problem by attending to the statistical properties of the input. Now, of course, prosody is also a, another statistical property, and, and pauses at the end of utterance is another statistical property. But we're focusing on one particular kind of statistical property, which we characterize as transitional probabilities. There's many, many such statistics. Um, and here's just something that some of you may not be familiar with, even if you're familiar with the, the study that was done with Jenny Safran and Lisa Newport. This is the corpus that the infants were exposed to in the experiment I just described. And because um, each word, each triple was equally frequent, that means that each part word happens relatively rarely. It's because a part word is an accidental collision of one word and another, another word, right? And so we're extracting the part word, and you can see the words are in red and the part words are in blue. There are more words than part words. So if infants were just counting, as if just counting would be that easy, but you know, if they were just counting, there's more red than blue. So maybe they're not computing transitional probability at all. They're just counting in a very sophisticated way. Well, there's a way to get around that problem. You can take two of the words and make them relatively infrequent. And two of the words make them relatively frequent so that the collision between the two frequent words creates a part word whose frequency is the same as the infrequent word. And then you only test the infrequent word and the part word. So now the corpus is balanced. There are exactly the same number of words and part words that will be tested. Okay? And you get the same result. So we're not making the claim that they're only doing transitional probabilities. What we're saying is that this experiment shows that when you eliminate all other sources of information, including frequency of occurrence information, and only allow transitional probabilities to be present, they can still do it. I actually think frequency is like the low-hanging fruit. Do frequency, right? It's so, it's so easy. But the point is that they can also do transitional probability, which is a more sophisticated, conditionalized statistic. Um, I was going to go through an fMRI experiment here, but let me not do that. Let me just say that there have been, an, and I'm going to zip through the slides really quickly, so don't look at those, just look at my mouth. <laughs> um, yes? Yes. So, so, should we start here? <laughs> no. Go back further? <laughs> yeah. no, okay, like this is the corpus. Where the word is only defined by its um, statistical there. properties. So, for example, the, wor the, 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 the syllable pa does not occur anywhere else unless it's next to a b. And B occurs nowhere else unless it's between a pa and a ku. So the, these putative words are defined solely on the basis of the statistical properties of their occurrence in order in the corpus. So I'm color coding them just to highlight the fact that these are the statistically coherent okay. chunks of auditory stuff. Okay. Yeah. Of course, they don't have any meaning. Well, they do for me, but, uh, okay. So, um, I, 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 would just, I just want to make one point here, and I'm not going to belabor this fMRI experiment. Talk to me later if, if you're interested. But what makes uh, the attempt to understand the neural mechanisms of something like statistical learning, or actually any kind of fairly complex linguistic materials presented in an fMRI type of paradigm, is that there are many, many things going on at the same time that you can't prevent people from doing. So, for example, imagine just taking this stream of speech and presenting it to individuals in the scanner, which we've done and other people have done. Well, there's an input encoding part. You might expect that the auditory system is doing something, trying to code the input as phonemes, let's say. There's this pattern extraction process, like transitional probabilities that might be going on. But there's all sorts of higher level things you're trying to in infer the underlying causal structure or make predictions about what the next stimulus is going to be. And typically at the end of the exposure phase, the exposure phase is essentially conflating all of these underlying processes. 
At the end of the exposure phase, typically there's a test phase, and in the test phase there's some sort of recognition or retrieval process going on that, that accesses the information that you've stored as a result of the learning phase. And it's very difficult in fMRI experiments to tease these things apart because they're all happening simultaneously. How do you eliminate input encoding? Well, you can't. You have input. Um, how do you focus just on prediction? It, it's difficult. I mean, so I, I'm not going to belabor the fMRI experiment. I'll just get th go through to the very end and say that an important feature of any fMRI experiment, in my judgment, is you have to have very clear behavioral data. Um, and some fMRI experiments do not have clear behavioral evidence. They have clear behavioral evidence in another experiment outside the scanner. But frequently when we put individuals in the scanner, they don't perform as well behaviorally. And then if at the end of the experiment you don't have good control of their behavior, it's hard to know what the, the neural signals infer about that behavior because you don't have control of the behavior. So we've been doing designs where we have repeated test phases interleaved between the exposure phases so we can monitor the change in their performance at the behavioral level so we, we can then make inferences about how that change in performance at the behavioral level uh, was affected by the changes at the neural level. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, in the next 10 minutes or so, let me tell you about the development of the lexicon, which is impossible, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go quickly. So, how are, so far we talked about phonetic skills and tuning to your native language, and we've talked about word segmentation, but how are these phonetic skills used to store the auditory word forms and build up this mental dictionary that we have. Um, and one simple experiment that you might think about doing, which has actually been done a long, long time ago, is to just, you know, hold up an object and say what it is and then hold up a different object and say what it is and then, you know, have a test trial and say, well, where's the, the GAC? And surprisingly enough, despite the fact that these are somewhat old experiments, Young children, older infants, so let's say like a 12-month-old, um, they're really not good at this. <laughs> um, and so Janet Worker and Les Cohen developed a technique that relied on looking behavior rather than kind of this overt choice behavior. And the experiment's very simple. There's a familiarization phase where they're getting two kinds of familiarization trials, one in which they actually hear sounds paired with an object. And they hear a different set of sounds paired with a different object. So it's having two physical entities and you're hearing two different sounds in correlation with those two physical entities. So it's like labeling. And then what they do, rather than ask the child a question in the, in the test phase, they simply present a match or a mismatch between what they had earlier. So this blue checkerboardy thing was B, right? And now they're seeing the blue checkerboardy thing with the other stimulus. They, they have a switch trial. And the idea is that if they notice the switch, because they've established the correlation between the sound and the, and the visual object, then they should look longer at the switch trial than the, than the non-switch trial. And that's exactly what they found. But they didn't find it until relatively late. Um, most 14-month-olds failed. Now, 14-month-olds are pretty old in light of what we've been talking about so far, right? The phonetic stuff was 6 to 12 months of age, the word segmentation stuff was 7 and 8 month olds, and this is 14 month olds. So what's going on here? Well, there's a number of reasons why uh, mapping a sound to a referent might be difficult. The objects were kind of weird novel things, they hadn't seen them before. The words were sounds that didn't really conform to the kinds of structures of canonical words in English. Um, the sounds were familiar, and we know they, they can discriminate between biz and biz, um, and easily discriminable. Um, but maybe the method wasn't so sensitive. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about a more um, elaborated version of looking time. So rather than ask how long do they look at something, I'm going to ask uh, what's the time course of looking at objects. Um, and this is based on work that really began in Anne Fernald's lab uh, in the 1990s. Um, the basic idea is you present two pictures, 
So it's just like the other experiment that I described earlier that failed. Um, but now you're, you're measuring with an eye tracker precisely where the baby is looking when they hear a sound. So if you, where's the apple? You would expect them to look reliably to the stimulus, and where's the ball? You'd expect them to look reliably there. But they might only do that for 200 milliseconds. So you're not measuring the total duration of time that they're looking at these two objects, because they might look back and forth. You're, you're measuring the detailed time course of when they look at the object. Uh, and in fact, you can have this little snippet of speech, like where's the ball, and you can time lock when they're looking at the apple with respect to the underlying words that are in that utterance. So this time course information is extremely important in online spoken word recognition in adults as well as in, in babies. Um, and so I want to pause here and just mention this technology paradigm that was developed by Jerry Altman and Mike Tannenhaus. Um, and basically, the individual is wearing some sort of eye tracking apparatus. In adults, you can put the eye tracking apparatus on their head. There's some reasons why you might want to do that. Babies, typically not. And they're looking at typically a screen that has a number of objects on it. And the, and the I'm going to skip the cohort theory thing. We don't really have time to go through that. Um, the point I wanted to make here about the, the methodology is that if this is the screen and you hear the following utterance, look at the cross, presumably you'll follow instructions like a good undergraduate. Now click on the beaker and you move the mouse around, right, because you have a mouse and you can click on this thing here. What's interesting is that you're measuring the eye track of that individual as they're listening to these sounds and making that mouse click. Um, the target in this particular case is the beaker. There's another word that starts with the same sound as beaker called a cohort. That would be the beetle. Uh, there's a rhyme, right? The end of the word sounds like beaker, but it's speaker. And then there's an unrelated word. And the logic of the experiment is as follows. There's a whole series of trials, okay? Discrete trials. And what you're doing is you're measuring where the individual is looking moment by moment. So let's say on the first trial, the individual looks right there as soon as they hear the word beaker. But notice on this trial, they first looked at uh, the beetle, and then they made a corrective eye movement and then later looked at the beaker, which was the correct thing to look at. If you sum across each time slice the probability of where they are looking at any moment in time, again, across a whole series of trials, you get these so-called activation functions here. On average, they're looking more reliably at the item that was mentioned, the target. But there's a little bit of a blip, again, time-locked to the unfolding of the, of the sentence, that indicates that they are confused or generating a, a hypothesis about looking at the item that matches the early sound of the target item. Um, and so that activation to the cohort indicates that there are multiple hypotheses that are being considered at the same time. That you're not waiting for the word to end before making the decision about what that word might refer to. And so this is providing you with time course information at the behavioral level um, that suggests a view of online word recognition that is kind of parallel processing candidate words on the way to finally resolving what the word is. Now, these are actual data, not fake data. These are fake data. That's why they look so nice. These are actual data. They look pretty good. Right? <laughs> these are actual data with these actual words. Right? And you see, looking to the target, these are adults. And you see the activation to uh, the cohort, the beetle. And moreover, you can create artificial lexicons. Why would you want to do an artificial lexicon? Why would you want to teach people new words? Well, it's because words in any native language that you're a sophisticated user of imply all sorts of other things that you don't have control over as an experimenter. Right, so you hear this candle, and it sounds like candy. It looks like a Bunsen burner. It feels like wax paper. Its letters look like camber, right, the orthography. It smells like smoke. Uh, it reminds me of birthdays. You know, I mean, all of these things could be rushing through your head at the same time, and you as the experimenter have to design your experiment trying to take into account all of those other variables. With an artificial lexicon, you teach people new words. They only see those words in a particular context. You can have control over their frequency and their acoustic similarity. Every participant get ex gets exactly the same exposure. Uh, 
So you know they don't come into the experiment with different amounts of knowledge. Um, and then you can you know, apply that to the same kind of experiment that I just described in English. And so there's a training phase where you're learning that these, these little shapes have names. And then there's data, and the data look pretty much like the data that you get when you have real words in English. So um, it, it's a way to try and get some leverage on all the complexity of a natural language by using an artificial language, which is like a dumbed-down version that you have better control over. Now that's all a bit of an aside in the adult literature, so let's go back to babies. We're not going to use a head-mounted eye tracker because it's somewhat difficult to use with babies. We could use a display like this, Toby eye tracker that has you know, the capacity to measure where on the screen the baby's looking. And this is an early experiment that Dan Swingley and I did where, again, you can't say look at the cross and now move the mouse and click on, <laughs> on the ball. You're just measuring where they're looking naturally. And so since you don't have control over where they're looking when the trial begins, they might already be looking at the ball or they might already be looking at the bottle, whatever the other stimulus may be. But when you start on the distractor, you should move to the other target if you understand the meaning of that word. And if you're already on the target, then you should stay, right? So these data show that infants reliably at 14 months of age for objects that they already know the names of by parental report will reliably look briefly, right? This is only happening over about two seconds. We'll briefly look at the referent that is referred to by that word. Now, you can ask then, well, how sophisticated is their underlying representation of the acoustic properties of that word? What if we do what Peter Jusik and I had done in that earlier experiment, but now in the context of this paradigm, we slightly alter the acoustic properties of the words? What if we used nonsense words that sound kind of like the words? Again, these are all words the baby knows. Um, and what we found is that when you pronounce it correctly, you get th these data. When you pronounce it slightly incorrectly, they are still reliably looking at the thing that is the best match. But they are also statistically reliably getting there slower. So that mispronunciation is something that they're sensitive to, even though they're making their best guess as to what you're referring to and going to the appropriate object. Um, now mispronunciation is interesting because what is mispronunciation for, for one speaker could just be an accent or a dialect for another speaker. They could be ref referring to exactly the same object appropriately, but their vocal tracks are different or they come from a different dialect. And so Catherine White and I wanted to know, well, how quickly can infants adapt to someone who speaks in a way that is not the canonical way that you would pronounce a word that they already know? So we picked objects that we knew they knew the names of, like bottle and you know, block and ball and so on. But what we did for half of the infants is we gave them pre-exposure to a talker who systematically mispronounced some of the words. So for example here, block was, was spoken as black, consistently spoken as black, over, over a couple minutes of pre-exposure. And then we asked, well, for those infants who heard the black stimulus, when they were presented with the actual stimuli to look at in the test phase, and they heard the word black, what, what did they do? And the answer is that they were just totally fine with the black. The infants who had not heard the speaker mispronounced the word block as black. When they were tested with black, they were confused, right? Because they had not been pre-exposed to this particular talker who had an accent. And in addition, it turns out that this pre-exposure, the block black case, did not apply to all the test items. So we can ask, can they generalize the accent from words that they have been exposed to in this pre-phase to now words that they have not been exposed to in the pre-phase? So for example, will they never having heard this referred to as a betel, when they hear that as a test item, do they find that to be acceptable? And the answer is yes. So they were able to generalize the mispronunciation behavior from the talker to items that had not been mispronounced in the pre-exposure phase. Did they associate this with a, with a particular um, 
we did not do, that's a really interesting experiment, we did not do what would happen if we now brought in a speaker who did not have that accent. I think what would happen is that they would have a talker-specific representation, because there's other work suggesting that they do. And so they would treat the canonical version uh, as the appropriate one, and only adjust to the talker who had mispronounced it. Yeah. You know, we only did it for vowels. We did not do it for consonants because it's somewhat more complicated and uh, it's easier to manipulate, manipulate the vowels. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yes? Right. So we did not do, we did not do Spanish speakers. Um, so you might pick Spanish or Italian or Japanese because they have many fewer vowels. Um, and there you, the prediction would be that they would be much more tolerant of acoustic variation because they have fewer categories to match to. I think that's, that would be the prediction I would make, yeah. Okay, so uh, Dan and I also did another experiment I just wanted to mention briefly and that is when you're learning a new word, so all the experiments I've described so far were words that the baby already knew by parental report. What happens when they're learning a new word? There is no such thing as a mispronunciation for a new word, right? Because it, it's, it's new. Um, and so they're confronted with two objects that they've never seen before, and they're labeled. And in one case, let's say this object is labeled Meb, and in the other case, this object is labeled tog. Now, in their lexicon, these are 18-month-olds, um, I believe. In their lexicon, there is no other word that sounds like meb. But in their lexicon, there is another word that sounds like tog. It's the word dog. And so there's competition there, potentially competition, in learning a new word for this new thing because you already have a lexical item in your mental dictionary that sounds a lot like that thing that is now getting uh, a new name. And we had another condition, Shang doesn't have a corresponding similarly sounding word in English, but Gaul has a word that's very common in their lexicon, ball. And the bottom line is that infants in this condition, where one of these guys is Meb and one of these guys is Shang, where there's no competition with words already in their lexicon, they'd learn them fine with a relatively small amount of pre-exposure. So you'd hold up the object and label it. However, these infants in this group, where they had words already in the lexicon that could potentially compete for recognition, they failed in this task. Now, of course, we're not claiming that they can never succeed on the task. It's just with this amount of exposure in a training phase, there was a difference between their ability to learn words that are sim acoustically similar to words they already know versus words that are not. And that's, that's a process, by the way, lexical competition is a process that's well known in the adult literature as well. Yes? Is it just that they, do they take longer or they just don't learn it? Well, we didn't extend the experiment to multiple days. I mean, I'm sure they would learn it, you know, if given enough exposure, because they have to learn hundreds of words in the natural environment. Mm-hmm. So the question is, how long does it take? For how long is enough? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. We just don't really know. Now, there have been a number of so-called fast mapping studies yeah. where literally one instance of, of a labeling event has been shown to have a statistically significant effect in an immediate test. But Larissa Samuelson has done some recent work showing that if you bring them back five minutes later, it's gone. So a lot of the fast mapping results seem to be quite transient. And so it raises the question of, you know, how much exposure is needed to get it into long-term memory? So it's really part of the lexicon. Yeah. In, in adults, Gareth Gaskell has shown very interesting changes in the representation of uh, the neighbors of newly learned words, where it seems that overnight sleep is required mm. for mm -hmm. like gall to start competing with right. Yeah, and Rebecca Gomez has done some interesting stuff and sort of artificial grammar learning on that same question of napping on the part of infants seems to facilitate extraction of certain grammatical properties. Yeah. There was another question? Yeah. 
Yeah. So in the homophone case, are you talking about production or are you talking about comprehension? Because on the production on the production side, there's lots of evidence that uh, acoustic similarity is actually facilitative, not inhibitory. Um, but I don't know of any. Alec, do you know of any work that's been done on homophones in? Uh -huh. to get the mapping, but that's what the adult um, will take their argument and pull up their reader lab and use it. Uh -huh. but, the, but the homophone case violates something that I'm just about to talk about, which is a mutu mutual exclusivity constraint, which seems to be powerful early, and I don't know that those two things may trade off. Yeah. So yeah. Holly Sparkle has been uh, traveling in data, showing a homophone advantage in uh, both production and uh -huh. Oh, um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, <coughs> so, for example, on uh, face recognition or some some totally different domain. Yeah. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, I would be very surprised if there aren't similar kinds of effects going on there. So you're learning some sort of arbitrary category distinction, and then. Um, uh, if, if, if you have shared features between two categories, would that interfere or facilitate your subsequent learning of a new category? Yeah. Um, I think Gene Mandler and, and possibly Les Cohen have done experiments like that, but I can't put my finger on right now. Philip Shins, with his Martian rocks, didn't he do something? Not developmentally, but maybe, maybe with adults, yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because it was easier for us to find minimal pairs that could interfere, yeah. yeah. Right. It might be, yeah. Yeah. Kate? Well, okay, so the monkey experiment is flipped around, right? So now the words are highly discriminable from each other, yeah. but the faces are not, but right? But you said the faces are smelled very clear, but learning takes a long time. Because it doesn't require learning labels for uh -huh. tools. Because I think learning which monkey language means, it's just that they have different names for the different things, and they don't have to make them all the words and call them all. Right. I think that's that's okay. that's the inference that I would make, and I think that's what Alec was referring to. It, it's the, in some sense, you could think of the the monkey's name, and the monkey's face, as a conjunction, and it could have been a, a bell, or it could have been a buzzer, and it, it's something that differentiates that monkey using another cue other than the visual information. And so it, I, don't, I don't think the monkey experiment was really about giving the monkeys names, but just giving them an additional source of information that they're different. It was also three months of exposure, whereas the this is this is ten minutes of exposure, and that was three months of exposure. So, yeah. They never tested that, not that I know of. Yeah, yeah. Now it's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to um, finish up here quickly by talking about one more eye tracking experiment, and then we'll pause, and we can have questions. And. Um,
So I wanted to make the point that eye tracking has also turned out to be an important individual differences measure. Uh, in particular, uh, Ginny Marchman and, and Fernald have been doing a whole series of experiments with um, families. They happen to be low socioeconomic status families that happen to have this characteristic of speaking less to their infants and young children than uh, what you might call typical middle class or Stanford community uh, uh, families. And the interesting, and there are many interesting things associated with this, and Anne does a whole big long talk about it. But what I think is really interesting is it's not that the vocabulary, the receptive vocabulary of these children is that different from middle class kids. But it's the speed which, with which they are able to access that information that is impaired. So there, th these are these eye movement functions as a f function of time when the word is spoken, so it's a word in isolation spoken, and how quickly do they move their eyes to the target that matches the word that has been spoken. So it's a really, really simple experiment. And in those children who come from these low SES homes are showing a, a delayed, not delayed over age, but a delayed over the micro time of recognizing which, uh, which object is being referred to by that word. And, you know, it's only about 200 milliseconds, which you wouldn't think would be that big of a deal. But in the context of fluent spoken word recognition, we have many, many words coming per second. Uh, that apparently, that delay can have these knock-on effects where it's more difficult for them to reach the standard milestones that you see, even for words that they know. So well, it's interesting. Study of late talkers, it's not late. Yeah, this, these are late talkers, yeah, yeah. right. But they're similar data with, with regard to other populations that they've looked at, yeah. So, um, I have a whole other section here that I need to skip through, so bear with me here. I, I, I just wanted to make a, a quick point, and then I'll go through quickly. So far, we've talked about speech perception, we've talked about word segmentation, we've talked about uh, the beginnings of understanding the, the, the meanings that is the, the visual object to which an acoustic word refers. Um, and the question is, are these things happening in a serial fashion? Or are they happening all at once? And I think the early view was it probably happens in a serial way. That is that you have to have the phonetic categories appropriately, and then you have to solve the word segmentation problem, and then you can solve the reference problem. And there's certainly evidence of that Katie Graf Estes did a really nice study where she presented streams of speech. So they had to segment the streams of speech based on transitional probabilities. And then she extracted those words or part words from the streams of speech and, you know, presented some novel object in Golabu, you know, Daropi. <laughs> um, and what she found is that they more easily attached, that is, in a referential way, the word, the statistically coherent word, to the object than the statistically less coherent part word to the object. So it, it's suggesting that these processes are happening in kind of a serial fashion. Um, I don't have time to go through this particular experiment other than to tell you that it's an eye tracking experiment that was done with Mohina Shukla and Catherine White. And what we did is we varied both the prosodic information and the statistical information that was presented in a series of utterances. And the bottom line message is that in six-month-olds, so these are quite young, six-month-olds, they're being exposed to a set of utterances. The utterances contain statistically based information about what a word is. And they also contain prosodic information. So there's a melodic contour to the utterances. So it's mimicking what infants are actually exposed to in the real world. And under those circumstances, they're not, a, not only able to extract the statistically coherent word, but they're able to extract it in a way that allows them to map it on to a referent in the world. And this is in six-month-olds. And that suggests that when you embed multiple sources of information together in the way in which infants are naturally exposed to it, they may be showing better behavior, 
than when you do a typical experimental psychology design where you tease apart, you throw everything away except one variable, and then you study that one variable. It's almost as if that's odd to infants because it's so unnatural to what they're normally exposed to in the real world. And uh, another example of that, little plug for Elika, is that Elika, as part of her dissertation, did an eye tracking experiment with pictures of objects that the parents had judged to be familiar to the infants. Not whether the infants knew the name of it, right, but just whether the object itself was familiar to the infant. And then presented those objects, you know, in a side-by-side -side kind of design on a computer screen and measured with the eye tracker where the babies are looking when they hear the name of that word. And this didn't quite come out as colorful as I'd hoped, but the important point is that at every age, starting from six months all the way up to 20 months, the average performance in each one of these age bins is statistically significantly greater than chance. Even the six to nine month olds are showing evidence of recognizing the picture that matches the word that they're being tested with. Now, it's not a whoppingly big effect here, but it's very statistically reliable. So it suggests, and it, it also is modulated by the particular items that the infant happens to be exposed to, but it suggests that this process of mapping sounds onto reference is happening much earlier than we originally had thought. And that this idea that there's a serial process going on where, you know, speech perception, word segmentation, reference, is probably just not right. It's probably happening in parallel in a rudimentary way quite early, certainly by six months of age. Um, yes, yeah, Simon. So I think it's the way I think it's the way science <laughs> tends to work. We tend to be very reductionistic and we study one variable at a time. And I think now I in this field we're to the point where we have to start thinking about the interrelationships among variables and how that might actually facilitate learning rather than being an impediment to learning. And I just have one more plug here. Um Elika is doing an interesting experiment now that involves gathering from the perspective of the baby what it is that's in their visual field. So you can't see this terribly well here, but the baby has a headband and there's two little cameras on the baby's head. One is kind of pointed down in the direction of their hands and the other is kind of pointed up so that we can get information about who's approaching the baby when they're looking down. And so that's represented by these two little shots here. And um, the, the basic endeavor is to understand what words are being spoken to the child while the child is attending to objects in their environment from their perspective, not from the perspective of a, of a camera that's in the corner of the room. Uh, so it's on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And then have the babies come into the lab. This is the part that's really been missing from the field. Have the baby come into the lab at regular intervals and be tested on items that they have been exposed to in the environment or items that they have not been <laughs> exposed to in the environment or items that we introduce into their environment so that we can, for example, create a nonsense object, give it a name, and have that name be similar to the name of something they already know the name of or not. Uh, and so a year from now, <laughs> there's a rather massive database of videos that will be created here. Uh, so I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and open things up for questions and or have David um, do his thing. Yeah. I guess we can take a few minutes for questions while and then move on to Tecumseh. Tecumseh?
had a comment to start with that sort of related to the, um, the weird, adapting to the weird speaker thing, which is that Alex, the gray parrot, the famous parrot who learned from Irene Pepperberg. May he rest in peace. May he rest in peace. Um, whose obituary was in the New York, the New York Times <laughs> recently, for those of you who didn't know, you can ask. But so he, he spoke, Irene has a strong Long Island accent, so it seems mm. very appropriate here in Long Island. Mm. And, he, and Alex did too. Alex is a sort of parrot Long Islander, but even when he was learning sounds, new words from people who didn't have that accent, he still had Aha. recognizable Irene Pepperberg accent. Right. So that suggests, though, you know, kind of blah, 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 but it suggests that he kind of internalized that phonology right. and was also able to, to, to map it on to, um, to novel words. Yeah. So that's a, just an observation for, for your interest. Yeah. My question was about, you, you had a, a nice graph up that showed pattern perception going three ways to, I think it was like prediction with prediction error and right. uh, model fitting, latent variables, and generative grammar. Yep. I'm getting there. That was just from a review paper that we had uh, somewhere. Uh, no. You're getting close. It's coming. Sorry, I should have just... Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I find that very interesting, and I, I'm interested in the, how, you, how you justify that structure. I mean, so what one gets the impression that all this stuff is going on all the time, and I don't know if this is supposed to be a baby or an adult or, or what, but is there some reason that you didn't put these in any kind of order? Because one might think that, that prediction that certain kinds of pattern extraction come first, and that that rules one at the bottom, generative grammar comes later. Or one might think that if one's a psychologist, and one might not think that if one's Noam Chomsky. Well, there is, there is. So is there any kind of implicit ordering, or what, what do you Yeah, think? I mean, there, there are the major arrows going from left to right, and so that, that, yeah. that was the time dimension. I'm talking about that stack of prediction. That no, the, the, the stack on the right, represents the terminology that different individuals, particularly computational people, apply to those similar processes. So some people will describe prediction error as a kind of rule. Other people will use the term rule because they are more comfortable with that. Um, Bayesian approaches tend to use things called latent variables, and so they refer to them. So what we're trying to do is to appease the different terminologies that are used in these different groups. But we think of the model building as being that stack. And so, again, there's different terminology. The prediction generates a prediction error. The latent causes in a Bayesian terminology is a belief updating. And the rules is kind of a generative grammar approach. Um, so we're, we're just trying to have sort of a framework that everybody could you know, potentially agree on as being very simple, uh, left to right through this. Okay, yeah. and, and so you're not really trying to make any claims with this particular diagram. No. It's basically just giving labels to things that That's right. pretty much that must be going on. In That's right. So this is sort of just a logical box yeah. uh, model. And the, the point I really was trying to make is that in a neuroimaging experiment, particularly one that has a hemodynamic response that is, you know, seconds after the stimulus, it's very difficult to isolate any one of these boxes. Right. Yeah. I just make one more point yep. about this, which is trying to, work to tie it to genetics. So it does look like there's some genetic differences in, in people's likelihood to do procedural versus declarative, which might somehow map onto the predictive versus local mm. causes. Mm. And I, I'm just, in a, in a way, it's a shame you didn't talk more about the brain imaging, though maybe we'll get another chance. Because if there's something that might map onto some of the genes that we know, say for example, FOXP2, mm -hmm. this stuff, I don't know what you think, Simon, about Morton Christensen's FOXP2 variants tying in with sequential yeah, but uh, grammar. I'm learning. waiting to see it, see it appear, because you know, this is the result of being. Okay, so that still hasn't been peer reviewed publicly. For six yeah, years now, so my assumption is that it's not. In fact, I've heard, I think, no. from Bruce Thomas, yeah, that it didn't appear. It didn't appear. I've heard something negative about it. The fact that it isn't out in the, that's why I kind of don't know what to okay. say about it. 
Anyway, just yeah. placeholder for that. I have a question that's about both the statistical learning and the very rich set of results on Word. And you can see the interesting absence of maybe strategic opacity on your part, not committing to uh, what a representational format is. Hmm. So, I mean, is it C++? <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, MATLAB. This goes for MATLAB. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And the something, I guess, is you know discreetly left out. So I wonder if you can speculate on that or tell us your answer. Well, well, my general answer is you're probably keeping track of statistics over many, many different things that are hierarchically related to each other. So I can, I mean, there's evidence that even at the phonotactic level, right, individual phonemes in positions within words, you keep track of. I mean, we know that from adults, but we also know it from babies. So Cindy Fisher and Kyle Chambers. But all of, all of the word segmentation work was predicated on the hypothesis that the elementary unit over which you're making this computation is the syllable. Well, we, we've done some work suggesting that it isn't just the syllable, that it's individual phones in combination with syllables. So you, you have this kind of hierarchy of, of statistical extraction. And of course, we know that we're keeping track of word frequency and probably frequency contextualized by topic. Let's and take frequency, which we all really yeah. love. I mean, there has to be a way to encode that. Right? So mm -hmm. When you write down in your brain, you know, the brain code, Microsoft brain, <laughs> that you have to be able to tag the frequency. Somehow. Right. And is the representation like linear or logarithmic or, yeah, right. Completely unclear right. Does, does it work at all? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But maybe we could get some traction on that by having neuroimaging methods. I'm not entirely confident that the behavioral level uh, will reveal that. Yeah. I think there are neuroimaging methods that show something of representational structure. Uh, the representation of similarity and that. Right. Cambridge colleagues have made a few good calls. Mm -hmm. Because you're encoding, you're, for example, articulatory features yeah, are a coding right. scheme that you have imposed. That's a yeah, claim, right. Uh, that, right. That's a theoretical claim. I thought we were yeah. Head. But so I, 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 I don't know. It's a representational analysis, it's yeah. an analytic tool. It's not a theoretical analysis. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know what the alternative is, right? I mean, as scientists, you, you impose some sort of coding scheme. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to be neutral about it, or as neutral as you could get, then you would impose other such schemes that you think are qualitatively different than the one that you had proposed and see who wins. Right? That's what the representational similarity approach would do. But you still don't know, even if it wins, whether it's the right one. But that's a mind-body problem, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know. It's the problem we face, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it sounds to me like this is exactly the kind of uh, the challenge that the next generation <laughs> <laughs> Kate, did you have a, a comment? Yeah. Well, let me take the Bayesian hat and put it on. I think what they're doing is that they're building a model that consists of a set of unobserved entities, call them causes, 
and that that model has to be fit to the data that they're, they're confronted with. So if they're given a lot of <clears throat> um, corticulatory, talker variability, all that other stuff that we think is not at the level of the phonology of the language, but is that ex extraneous stuff, then perhaps one of the reasons that they have difficulty is that they're inferring a set of latent causes that are incorrect, and then they need more data to hone in on the model that is best fitting the data. And, uh, you know, they have a set of priors. If, if, if you don't like that terminology, innate constraints, whatever they may be, that pushes them in a certain direction to interpret information in a way that conforms to those priors. And if the priors are strong, they have to have lots and lots of evidence that counteracts those priors if, if they turn out to be incorrect. Um, so the rate at which development of this happens, I think, depends on the diversity of the input that they have, the priors that they bring to the task of learning, and um, how much input that they're getting that conforms to that underlying structure. And that's probably why you have lots of individual differences, right? We've glossed over individual difference completely here. Um, those variables are probably extremely important, and I don't think we have a good handle on them. And that, that then is related to special populations, right? Because they're another form of individual difference that I think we don't have a good handle on, although we'll hear about it later, right? In, in my world, I find adults just hopeless. <laughs> 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 They're too smart, right? They've had too much exposure. Ev everything's overlearned. And once you've learned an orthography, you can't unlearn it, right? It's not something you can just dispense with. It sort of automatically gets activated. So that's one of the reasons why our group and others have sort of pushed the artificial language paradigm, because it, that's still not pure, right? Because I can teach you the word pibu, and you will see the letters, so to speak, right, the, uh, that, that go with that, um, that sound. Um, so I think for infants, obviously, <laughs> orthography is not a big problem because they don't have one yet. Um, and even for toddlers, probably not too much of a problem, although they get exposed to orthography certainly by, you know, two years of age. Um, but I do think it's... I do think it's a, confo a potentially confounding factor, certainly in adults, and could lead to um, much more categorical-like effects than you otherwise would have without an orthography. Right. Don't have, right. Are we going to get to? Are we going to get to David? We're all just dying to hear what David has to say. So, you don't think so? <laughs> <laughs> are you, are you I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Unless there are other quick questions. Okay. Well, I have one more question. Okay. Um, when you're talking about speech perception, I think something you had, had in my talking earlier, um, in the boundaries of 25 milliseconds, well, uh, it seems slightly unnatural that 25 rather than zero. You'd think zero is kind of the, the natural boundary. Um, and we were wondering if anyone has looked at it, if anything explain it. What is it, what are the acoustic features that make those 25 milliseconds boundary when particularly special? I'm glad you asked that question. Okay. So Irv Pollack, who was one of David Bizzoni's advisors at Michigan, did a study back in the late 1950s on temporal order judgments. So these are just noise bursts that, you know, they either appear simultaneous they're band-limited noise bursts, right? So there's a high band and a low band. And they come either simultaneous with each other, their onsets, or one leads the other or lags the other, right? And it turns out that your ability to judge the presence of a temporal onset asynchrony is about 20 milliseconds. 
What? That's the simultaneity threshold. That's right. That's a little bit shorter. That's in the Audrey system, two to three milliseconds. The 25 millisecond threshold is the order. Oh, the, oh okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So there are multiple thresholds in the Audrey system from very fine grain to the coarser grain. Mm -hmm. And the, they follow from physiological principles in the Audrey course. I mean, they have to do with refractory rates of neuronal firing and so on. So there's a, just a kind of boring physics explanation for this. Uh -huh. But did, did I get the, the original experiment first in Sherry? Ah, okay. They had a whole series of them, both auditory, somatosensory, visual, and cross-modal. There's a huge uh -huh. literature on this. And in, interestingly, the order threshold across experiments was always between 20 and 30 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But the threshold of simultaneity, which is conditioned by more peripheral mechanisms, is different. Okay. So there's this kind of biophysics of neurons explanation for this. Okay. Simultaneity is different for, for vision and, and simultaneity sound. threshold is different for so it's longer for modality. It's, so it's longer for the visual system, mm. for instance. It's the fastest for it's somatic sensory is pretty fast, so it's it's the fastest for the auditory system, two milliseconds. But the ordering threshold is the same for It's the same. It's the same across modalities. It's mm. always between twenty and thirty milliseconds. Uh, thank you. Great.